Mercy, Director of Siena College's McCormick Center for the Study of the American Revolution. Welcome to the Dell and Audrey Thompson Distinguished Lecture in American Revolution Studies. The Thompson Lecture honors Dr. Dell Norman Thompson, longtime Director of Development at Siena College, and an enthusiastic advocate for the History Education Initiative that would develop into the McCormick Center for the Study of the American Revolution. The lecture series named in his honor is an opportunity for our students and the wider community of history professionals and history enthusiasts in the capital region to engage a prominent historian in early American history. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Rose Marie Zagari to Siena College. Dr. Zagari is university professor and professor of history at George Mason University. She is a specialist in the history of American politics and the author of three books, The Politics of Size, Representation in the United States, 1776 to 1850, A Woman's Dilemma, Mercy Otis Warren and the American Revolution, and Revolutionary Backlash, Women and Politics in the Early American Republic. She is also the editor of, Lo of The Life of George Washington, the only biography authorized by Washington prepared by his aide, David Humphreys, in 1789. Dr. Zagari's latest book project is called A Tale of Two Empires, Thomas Law, British India, and the Early American Republic. Dr. Zagari is a contributor to C-SPAN, with on-camera appearances on the network's Book TV and Morning Journal. She also appeared in the PBS American Experience documentary, George Washington, The Man Who Wouldn't Be King. She has been honored with fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Antiquarian Society, and the American Philosophical Society. She was awarded Outstanding Article Prize for Morals, Manners, and the Republican Mother by the Southeastern 18th Century Studies Association. In 1993, the Fulbright Commission appointed her to the Thomas Jefferson Chair in American Studies at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. She is also a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, a professional society dedicated to the teaching and study of American history. Siena's students in history, political science, and women's studies have been preparing for Dr. Sigari's visit for a few weeks now. Several have studied revolutionary backlash, women in politics in the early American Republic. In backlash, which as we mentioned was available here, Dr. Zagari explains that women emerged from the American Revolution with a presence in the political culture of the 1790s and early 1820s, but they were increasingly unwelcome in politics by the 1820s. She contends that men and their political parties orchestrated a severe, sustained, and successful counter-revolutionary backlash against women's political activities and identities, a backlash that succeeded in justifying women's exclusion from public political roles to such a degree that by the 1820s, many women accepted without question private and domestic roles for themselves and their daughters. Simon P. Newman, the broken professor of American history at the University of Glasgow, called Revolutionary Backlash a deeply researched and gracefully written book that integrates political history and women's history more effectively and more persuasively than any previous work. It is our sincere pleasure to have her here at Siena College. Please welcome Rosie Zagari. It is my sincere pleasure to be here at Siena College to be among people who think about the American Revolution, you know, you have to because of your class, um, or, and, and who care about the American Revolution and who live in such a historic area near the Saratoga Battlefield. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is kind of give um, an overview of women's participation in the Revolution by looking at some specific examples. Um, for those of you who read the book, you might find the lecture emphasizes the sort of glass half full aspect of the revolution, while my book emphasizes the glass half em empty aspect. But if we would like to talk about that more during the question period, I'm happy to do that. But um, I'd like to, to start by having you imagine yourself as a resident of Philadelphia in 
in Philadelphia in 1780. The American War for Independence is raging throughout the colonies. You're relieved because two years earlier, the hated British army evacuated your city and headed south. But you know that the war is going badly for your side. Savannah has fallen. Charlestown has fallen. The Continental Army is desperately short of men, money, and supplies. You hear a knock at the door. You open it and find a startling sight. A respectable matron of Philadelphia is at your door asking for funds to support the troops. What now, you think? This war has already led servants to demand better treatment from their masters. It's led to Indian uprisings on the frontier. It's produced massive numbers of slaves running away from their owners. And now women who should be home tending their homes and families are out in public seeking support for the American cause. You admire the women's patriotism, but fear that the revolution that is underway will, if it's successful, lead to consequences far different from what the delegates who crafted the Declaration of Independence in 1776 ever anticipated or intended. Would this American War for Independence also be a revolution for women? The men who gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1776 did not fully understand, nor were they able to control the revolution they had put in motion. The story of the American Revolution for women, then, is a study in unintended consequences of how revolutions once begun can take on a life of their own and lead to changes that the leaders did not initially anticipate, nor did not necessarily approve of. In order to understand the experience of the revolution for American women, we first need to understand a little bit about the status of women at the, at the, on the eve of the American Revolution. For women in the colonial period, as in England at this time, politics and government were thought to be the exclusive realms of men. Men owned land, and land was the basis of the franchise. Only those who owned property, it was thought, possessed the virtue, the independence, and the stake in society that qualified them to vote. Women were politically invisible and legal non-entities. They could not vote, and if married, could not own property or sue or be sued in court. They were considered to be under the legal protection first of their fathers and then of their of their husbands. Their, their realm was the hearth and the home. They were supposed to leave politics, politics and war to men. Now to better get a, a sense of how women might have contributed to and participated in the American Revolution, how women can be considered founders of the Republic, I'd like to examine more closely the lives of a few individual women in particular their names, for the most part, are not household words like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or even Abigail Adams, who, I might add, is mostly known today uh, because she was the wife of a famous man, John Adams. The lives of these women, though, uh, Esther de Burt Reed, Phyllis Wheatley, and Elizabeth Alexander Stevens, can provide a vehicle for us to understand how and in what ways women shaped the founding of our nation. One of the first and most enduring effects of the American Revolution was to bring women into the political arena, to make women politically conscious, aware, and involved. And as I've suggested, this was a big order considering the prejudices against women's involvement in politics that existed on the eve of the revolution. I'd like to first, ter, turn first to Esther de Burt Reed. Again, not a well-known name, but Reed was born in London in 1747, the daughter of a wealthy merchant who had extensive trading relationships with the American colonies. In 1763, Joseph Reed of New Jersey, also the, the child of a merchant, 
went to London to study law. He met Esther de Berg, and both immediately were enamored of one another. Family circumstances compelled Joseph Reed to return to America in 1765. The two corresponded for five years. Like John and Abigail Adams, both Esther and Joseph Reed were fascinated by political matters. Often their letters were filled with, with discussion of the political controversies that were roiling the relationship between the colonies and Great Britain in the late 1760s. Finally, in 1770, Joseph, having become, a, having become a successful lawyer, returned to England, married Esther, and returned with, with, to Philadelphia with Esther and her widowed mother. The couple subsequently had four children. When Esther de Burt Reed entered the United States, she entered a world that was in turmoil. Beginning with the Stamp Act, in 1765, continuing with the Townshend Acts in 1768, and then followed by uh, the Coercive Acts in 1774, Americans were outraged at a series of measures that the, that the British Parliament had imposed on the colonies. The colonies had begun to take united action. One of the most important, important of their actions was to impose a series of boycotts on the colonies. The Continental Congress had requested, asked, imposed if they could, that, that, that all Americans neither import nor export goods to Great Britain. This was an attempt to put economic pressure on the mother country. Since the colonies had no representation in Parliament, they had no direct route, they had no direct voice in parliamentary legislation. They thought if they could influence the merchants, if they could induce the merchants to pressure Parliament, then they might have their say. They might pressure Parliament indirectly to repeal these hated measures which tax them without their consent. Winning the support of women was essential, the political leaders quickly realized. Women were often the family's primary consumers, the purchasers of goods. These women, if, if the boycotts were to be successful, had to stop buying all the things that they imported from Britain and which they greatly enjoyed. Cloth, textiles, ribbons, hats, buttons, china, and of course tea. But how to get women's cooperation? How could the Continental Congress and other local political re leaders reach out to women and convince them that they too had a stake in these boycotts, that they too had a stake in this controversy with England. Political leaders then began to appeal to women through a variety of oral and spoken means, through sermons, through political orations, poems and essays published in newspapers and, and magazines and broadsides posted on the sides of buildings. All of these efforts were an attempt to persuade women that they too had a stake in this resistance movement, that they were participants, that their actions could be important for the success of the cause. So men were reaching out to women, and in doing so, they were acknowledging that women had a political role to play in these boycotts against British goods. And in doing so, they were acknowledging that women were political agents, that they were political actors, that they weren't political ciphers. Women responded. Some women organized themselves into groups called the Daughters of Liberty. This was a group that was a, a female counterpart to the male Sons of Liberty organization that had popped up in many cities along the seacoast. These women considered themselves leaders among their peers in resisting British tyranny and protesting these acts of parliament that were found to be so offensive. How did they show or demonstrate their patriotic sentiment? Well, they did so in a way that was, as one contemporary put it, befitting their sex. 
Women held patriotic spinning bees where they made homespun cloth. They did so rather than import the fine linens or, or woolens that they enjoyed from Great Britain. They made clothes from this homespun and they wore these clothes on their bodies. And in doing so, they visibly and vividly demonstrated their patriotism. Some women actually protested in public. They did so when they heard of merchants who were violating the boycotts and who continued to import or sell British goods. And there's a famous case in Boston where women actually marched on the merchant's store, demanded the keys to his warehouse, and rather than fight the women, he very reasonably turned his keys over to them. In certain places, such as Boston in 1776 and Edenton, North Carolina in 1774, women wrote and signed their own non-importation agreements. And this, of course, points to the fact that a significant proportion of women at this time were literate. They were reading newspapers. They were reading political tracts. They were absorbing the lessons of the resistance movement and making it their own. And this image, which I'd like you to take a look at, is an image of the Edenton, North Carolina ladies signing their own non-importation agreement. If you pay close attention, you might notice that it's a bit of a caricature because it was published in London and the engraver is decidedly unimpressed and actually negative toward these women's actions. Uh, a few key points. Uh, the women are, are grossly caricatured. They, they, they look distorted, they ugly, exaggerated. There is a, there are children not being taken care of by their, their uh, mothers who are under the table while the women are engaging in political action. There's a dog urinating as the women are busy going about their actions. There's a man kissing a woman uh, and, and suggesting the lascivious and licentious nature of their activities. So not everyone, especially those in Britain, were pleased or impressed by women's political activism in the colonies. Nonetheless, this image, this, uh, this, this uh, portrayal indicates that people on both sides of the Atlantic were aware of women's increasing politicization, their increasing turn to the resistance movement and involvement in political activity. That it was controversial is less surprising than that people are acknowledging its existence. So, women organized, women responded individually by not buying British goods, and more and more women were becoming, middle class women of course, middle class and elite white women we're talking about here, were becoming more and more interested and involved in the politics of resistance and particularly in the politics of the boycott. So when Reed, when Esther de Burke Reed emigrated to America in 1770, she came in the midst of all this political activity and she saw that male political leaders had realized that women were a secret weapon in the resistance movement. And she too came to understand that she would have a role to play in the movement against Britain. Now this is sort of a tricky issue, isn't it? She's a recent immigrant from Great Britain, but like her counterpart, her male counterpart, Thomas Paine, she quickly switched her allegiances and began to identify with the American cause rather than with the British. Reed saw the coming of the War for Independence as beginning a new phase for women. Women whose husbands served in the military or in government at the state or national levels faced long periods in which their husbands were away, either serving on the battlefield or serving in legislatures. As we know, um, this was that both Abigail Adams and Esther DeBert Reed missed their husbands but also had to take up the business of their husbands while their husbands were away. They had to become what you might call surrogate men, surrogate husbands, and, and taking over the family farm, the family business, business, the managing of the household, the children, the slaves or servants, while their husbands were busy engaging in the business of revolution. 
Esther Reed's husband assumed a series of leadership positions in the Pennsylvania Assembly and then as a military aide to George Washington and later as a governor of Pennsylvania. So Esther Reed then had to face some very unpleasant and scary prospects. She had to assume a lot of duties in the household that she may not have felt prepared for, that she may not have wanted to take on. But she did so, at least in part, because she knew it was her duty. Her duty not just to her family, but to her husband and to the larger political movement that she had become committed to. For women, even for women whose husbands were not directly involved in revolutionary business, they understood that this was a civil war and they faced a lot of difficulties. They faced food shortages. They could not get the goods and supplies they needed. There were epidemics. There was social turmoil. And there was the constant threat of violence. So even women who are not directly involved in the revolution faced the possibility of of the consequences of the revolution visiting them. And for women whose husbands were away, the fear that their husbands might be captured or killed as a result of their involvement was even more scary. So they too were asked to make sacrifices for the revolution, even as they stayed on the home front, even as they remained wives and mothers. But Esther Debert Reed wanted to take her contribution farther make a deeper contribution. Because of her husband's position with George Washington as his military aide, Esther Reed was acutely aware of the needs of the American troops, how poorly provisioned and supplied they were, the lack of compensation, the dire con conditions under which they lived. Not content with sitting on the sidelines, she, Esther Reed, wanted women to gather funds for the troops, to make a specific offering of the ladies, as she <coughs> called it, to support the cause. So in 1780, she published an essay called The Sentiments of an American Woman. And in this essay, she expressed in no uncertain terms her love for her adopted country. She invoked history, and the history of nations and the history of, of um, the Bible to cite women such as Joan of Arc, who had been patriotic, who had been brave, who had sacrificed for their country. And like men, she said, and this is a quote, women were born for liberty and disdained to bear the irons of a tyrannic government. Women were born for liberty and disdained to bear the irons of a tyrannic government. She knew that even though women couldn't vote, didn't have a lot of the same rights and liberties as men, that they too suffered under tyranny, that they too suffered under the kind of despotic government that Britain had become. So in 1780, Reed spearheaded a drive to raise money for the support of the troops. She rallied a group of respectable women, and I emphasize respectable. These were not lower class women who might be thought to be, thought to be disorderly or are troublemakers. These were respectable middle class and upper class women. And these women in Philadelphia reached out to friends and relatives for funds for the troops. Sometimes they actually went door to door, and hence my opening anecdote. The shock that respectable people of Philadelphia would feel at opening the door to see a woman acting in a political cause, acting in public, asking for money for the support of the troops. Very, very radical for the time. <coughs> Through their efforts, over $7,000 was collected. Reed wanted to actually give the troops money. She wanted to give them gold coins. But Washington feared that the troops may not have had the wisest judgment as to how to spend the money and spend it on drink rather than on supplies for themselves. So the women instead used the money to buy cloth, and they made shop, shirt, shirts and socks for the troops. And in these shop, sock, I can't say that, sock, socks and shirts, they engraved their own names. So the troops that received their donations would know 
that this was a donation of the ladies. Similar efforts occurred in Maryland and Virginia and New Jersey, where women actively solicited funds for the troops troops and sent their money to the Continental Army. So this is a direct expression of women's political involvement in the revolutionary cause, a di direct expression of their <coughs> activism, the extent to which they identified with the cause and felt the need to get involved. Women, it, it, it's clear, could be as involved as, as men in winning the war, but in their own way in a manner befitting their sex, as a contemporary observer put it. In effect, though, women were no longer political ciphers. They were no longer politically invisible. They had become active political agents. Now, the second individual I'd like to talk about, this may be familiar to some of you, and that is Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley, as you might know, was born in Africa around 1753. She was captured and sold into slavery as a young child. In 1761, Susanna Wheatley, the wife of a wealthy Boston merchant, purchased the young Phyllis to be a domestic helper, a domestic slave. But from a very early age, Wheatley demonstrated that she was not an ordinary enslaved person. She was a very quick learner with a keen intellect. Violating established custom, the Wheatleys educated their young charge. They taught Phyllis to read and write, and they schooled her in geography and history and religion. They even taught her to read the classics in Latin, which made her far better educated than most, certainly most women, but even most men at the time. And most of all, the Wheatleys impressed the young Phyllis with a very devout sense of Christianity. She was a very committed Christian and very committed to the, to the Wheatleys and to their brand of Christianity. At some point as a teenager, Phyllis took up her pen and began to compose poems, many of which were religious in nature. The Wheatleys were stunned by their young charge's gift began to seek publication for her works, first in newspapers and then as a bound volume. One of her first poems was about the religious leader, the itinerant George Whitfield, who had spread the First Great Awakening throughout the American colonies. Her works garnered immense attention, at least in part because they were written by an enslaved person and an enslaved young woman at that. The Wheatleys were in touch with sympathetic readers in England who were hostile to slavery and who saw the possibilities for popularizing the cause of abolition through Phyllis. In May 1773, Phyllis journeyed to England where she made contact with many notable people who were extremely impressed with her abilities. She gained a patroness, patroness the Countess, Countess of Huntingdon, who sponsored the publication of her book of poetry, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, in 1773. And this is a copy of that work. In 1774, Susanna Wheatley died, and Phyllis was freed some time after that. After her mistress's death, Wheatley married a free black man, John Peters. They had three children, all of whom died in infancy. But in freedom, Whitley found unexpected challenges. She had a difficult time finding employment, and she and her husband struggled to support their family. Always in frail health, in 1784, just after the American War for Independence had ended, Wheatley died. Yet I don't want to emphasize the tragic aspects of her life. What I want to emphasize is that she identified, she came to identi and identify as an American, and as a patriot. She enthusiastically supported the American cause and wrote poems in, faith, in support of that, that effort. There are many poems with patriotic themes or subjects. She wrote about the struggle against British tyranny. She, rose, she wrote about America's glorious future 
she saw and had a vision of America as a great nation. And what's interesting in this poetry is it seems to, she seems to have fully identified as a citizen of this new nation. She did not distinguish herself because she was a person of color. In 1775, for example, she wrote a poem in honor of His Excellency George Washington. She praised George Washington's prowess as commander-in-chief and celebrated the American struggle for freedom against Britain. Despite her many years as a slave, she, she saw an American struggle against British tyranny, freedom for her, herself, and potentially freedom for other enslaved people. Exceptional as Wheatley's abilities were, she was not the only enslaved person who saw in the American Revolution potential for their own freedom. In many states in both the North and the South, enslaved people took the ideals of liberty seriously. White people began to see the contradiction between slavery for black people and freedom for white people. In many states, Slaves or their advocates petitioned their state legislatures, invoking the principles of natural rights and equality in an effort to free the slaves. Sometimes they used the very words of the Declaration of Independence in seeking the slaves' freedom. In some places, slaves didn't bother with the formalities. It is believed that anywhere from 20 to 50,000 enslaved people took advantage of the dislocations of war and ran away. They freed themselves during the era of the American Revolution. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson themselves both, both lost slaves during the American Revolution, slaves who ran away to claim their freedom. And this was surely an irony of the American Revolution, of the paradox of slavery and freedom that was not lost on either Washington or Jefferson. And so, for Phyllis Wheatley, who started the revolution, who started the revolutionary era as a slave and found freedom, the revolution offered hope, offered freedom, offered the possibility for inclusion. And she, at least, and many enslaved <coughs> people, used the revolution as a time in which they could claim that freedom, that personal liberty for themselves. The last woman that I'd like to focus on is potentially even more obscure than either of the two I've talked about before. Her name is Elizabeth Alexander Stevens. And Stevens was born into a prominent political family in New York. She married a wealthy man who was active in politics, who became secretary to the governor of New York. But what's most important about Stevens for our purpose is that she became a widow. After her husband died in 1792, she moved to New Jersey. She was a wealthy widow. She owned property. She paid taxes on the property she owned. And there in New Jersey, Elizabeth Alexander Stevens had the opportunity to do what women in no other state could do. She could cast a ballot and vote for candidates to state, local, and federal office. Now remember, this is over 100 years before the passage of the 19th Amendment. How was this possible? How was it that women, widowed women, single women, unmarried women in New Jersey could vote? Well, it's important to understand that in 18th century Britain and America, suffrage was considered a privilege of property. It wasn't considered a natural right. It wasn't something that belonged to all men or all people. It was something that people gained, men gained, because they owned property. Only those earning, owning a certain amount of property in the various colonies and then in the various states were allowed to vote. And by custom, since married women could not own property, this meant men. Now, single women and widowed women could own property, but again, by custom, they largely did not <coughs> exercise that right to vote or that privilege of the franchise.
we do have a couple of famous instances in colonial Virginia and in Britain where women did attempt to do so. But in general, women did not vote or attempt to vote even if they owned property. But something important happened during the revolution. <clears throat> women became aware of the political rhetoric that was raging around them. They became sensitive to that rhetoric and began to do something that the Continental Congress and other political leaders had not anticipated. They began to apply that rhetoric to their own condition. So during the American Revolution and before, women listened to attacks on Britain regarding no taxation without representation and how that was wrong, that was unjust, that was a violation of basic rights. In Virginia, Hannah Lee Corbin, a wealthy widow, wrote to her brother, Richard Henry Lee, in 1776, just on this point. She asked her brother, Richard Henry Lee, in an outraged tone, why revolutionary principles did not apply to her. As a wealthy widow, she owned land. She paid taxes. Why was she deprived of her voice and representation when she had as much stake in society as many men? Well, Richard Henry Lee was flabbergasted. Like John Adams, when he received Abigail Adams' missive to remember the ladies, he simply didn't know how to respond. Lee wrote back, and he pointed to custom and tradition as the grounds for women's exclusion. He admitted the weakness of this exclusion, but didn't anticipate that society would be changing these norms anytime soon. But surely, no one in Philadelphia in 1776, except perhaps John Adams, would have thought that change would go in this direction. Except in New Jersey. It alone, um, it alone among the 13 original states, followed revolutionary principles to their logical conclusion. New Jersey, the, in 1776, the New Jersey legislature and wrote the New Jersey Constitution. And in this Constitution, voting was described in what we would call gender-neutral language. And they said all inhabitants who were worth 50 pounds were eligible to vote. Now, while this particular phrase is ambiguous, in 1790 and in 1797, the legislature passed subsequent statutes that clarified the meaning. And they explicitly referred to voters using the pronouns he and she. So in subsequent statutes after the 1776 Constitution, the New Jersey legislature wrote electoral statutes about voting procedures that talked about the voters using the words he and she. So there's no doubt that the New Jersey legislature desired to enfranchise women. So, after that time, it was clear that any unmarried women who met the 50-pound property requirement could vote on the same terms as men. And there is indeed evidence that women, and possibly Elizabeth Alexander Stevens, did vote in New Jersey elections. We know this because there was incredible controversy in New Jersey over this experiment in female suffrage. Many men, as well as many women, found the idea of women voting strange, foreign, unacceptable. It violated their notion of what men's and women's proper roles should be. While it might be acceptable, at least marginally, for women to get involved in informal political activities, such as the boycott, it definitely seemed to violate established norms by having women vote to exercise the franchise in the same way that men did. So throughout the 1790s and into the early 19th century, pamphlets, newspapers, and the New Jersey legislature itself bandied about the issue of the female franchise. There were arguments and counter-arguments about the wisdom, the validity, the legitimacy of women voting in New Jersey. Some people, some of these attacks were hysterical, outrageous or self-contradictory. 
While some authors said that women lacked the knowledge and judgment to participate in politics, others feared that women were getting too knowledgeable about politics, were acting too much like men by participating in politics. They abhorred the influence of women on politics. They accused women of forming what they called a petticoat faction or of becoming manly women. Because if you did what men did in the political realm, you were acting like a man. Hence, you were manly. You were becoming too masculine. The boundaries between, between the sexes were being eroded. <coughs> and if women could vote, it was inevitable, a lot of people thought, that women would then seek public office. <coughs> that women would try to govern men. How ludicrous. How outrageous. As one New Jersey newspaper article put it, in a poetic form, to Congress low, widows shall go, like metamorphosed witches, clothed in the dignity of state, and eke in coats and breeches. Women who became legislatures were like witches. Clothed in the dignity of state, they would have to become like men and abandon their petticoats and wear men's clothing. Allowing women into the public sphere, into the political sphere, into the sphere of government in this direct way threatened the differences between the sexes. It th threatened the boundaries between the sexes. It threatened men's and women's roles alike. Serious efforts were made in the New Jersey legislature to eliminate female suffrage repeatedly, but especially in 1799 and 1802. After a particularly contentious election in 1807, there were ac accusations of fraud against the voters. It was said that men dressed up as women. Men pretended to be women to cast their ballots several times. Men disguised themselves as women to advance the interests of their own party. So in the New Jersey legislature in 1807, both parties came to agree women should be excluded from the franchise. They passed a law that not only disenfranchised women, but also free black males who had been previously allowed to vote under the same statute that enfranchised women. Nonetheless, it was clear that women, the very act of women casting ballots in New Jersey had proved an important point. Women were capable it was possible for women to act politically on the exactly the same terms as men. Historians sometimes treat the American Revolution as a kind of disappointment <coughs> in terms of its consequences for women. There was no mass feminist movement that emerged out of the American Revolution. There were few laws passed that changed women's legal status. As we've seen, the experiment in female suffrage lasted only from 1776 to 1807. So was there an American Revolution for women? The changes for women, I think it's important to acknowledge, were not just on the surface, they were mostly beneath the surface. There were changes in assumptions and attitudes. There were changes in the understanding of women's status to an acknowledgement now that women could be political beings, that they could be politically active, that they did have certain rights, and that they could contribute to the polity. And in the wake of the revolution, women did have greater recognition from the larger society that even in their roles as wives and mothers, they could make a political contribution. And as a result, there was a greater effort to educate women, to make women politically aware, to acknowledge that women had a stake in politics. Literacy rates for women continued to rise. More and more educational facilities for women were founded, female seminaries, female educational institutions. And it was understood that in their role as wives and mothers, <coughs> women would educate the next generation of citizens, encourage their husbands and sons to, good, to be good, patriotic 
citizens. So women could be both patriotic themselves, but in their roles as wives and mothers, could encourage their families, their husbands, and children to become patriots themselves. Now, in the long run, this growth of female literacy and rising political consciousness had other consequences as well. Women became more involved in the public realm. They started to get involved in charitable organizations that distributed Bibles or gave aid to missionary societies or helped widows and poor people. They also began to participate in benevolent movements that worked to end, to, to bring about temperance, to end excessive drinking in the society, or to work for the end of the major blight affecting the United States, the blight of slavery. Women took more and more of a role in these reform movements in the early decades and middle decades of the 19th century. And they did so because the revolution had authorized women's activities outside of the home. They authorized their ability to participate and they, they acknowledged that women could indirectly affect the polity. And by the 1840s, women would seize on the principles of natural rights and equality and make the case for themselves that they deserved equal status with men. And this created the first feminist movement. And this movement, as many of you are I'm sure aware, produced the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 and the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments that came out of this, this meeting um, then echoed the Declaration of Independence in its sentiments. It declared what had been implicit in the document of 1776, that all men and women are created equal, and demanded in very forthright terms that this new government of the United States treat men and women equally, not just allowing women indirect political participation, but direct participation <coughs> in voting, in their professions, and equal treatment in their moral status. So, the American Revolution for Women then meant that women had a new way to claim a place in political society and it put them on the path to be able to claim equal status with men in that society. By by, in the revolutionary era, they practiced a patriotism that was, as a contemporary observed, of a kind befitting their sex. In doing so, they paved the way for a patriotism that had no sex. Thank you. Just simply 
acknowledged that women could vote, but didn't see it as part of any larger pattern. Women's historians also knew about it and acknowledged it, but they didn't like what happened in New Jersey because it didn't fit their pattern of rising female political involvement. Women were involved for a time, they were disenfranchised, and what I didn't say during my talk is that women didn't rise up in mass protest, okay? And why didn't they rise up? Well, I think there's several explanations. One is that only unmarried, women, single women or widows could vote, and so that's not the entire female population, so it's a small subset of women that could vote, and also, I think the fact that voting was still considered a privilege of property rather than a natural right meant that, oh well, the legislature gave us a privilege and they could take away this privilege. And because women were not banding together as women, they didn't identify themselves as women as a group with special interests, they didn't think to organize to protest the loss of the vote. And so for women's historians, this is kind of a very disturbing episode. This is an episode that suggests that women were not as politically uh, attuned and marching for their rights as they would like to have had us believe. But for me, what this proves is what I call the backlash, which is just that during the revolution, there was a time in which people were willing to entertain all sorts of outrageous notions. And New Jersey actually took the step of putting one of these notions into practice and allowed women to vote, okay? And, and the fact that they, they withdrew this privilege is kind of less surprising that, than that they entertained the idea in the first place. But it is symptomatic of what happens at, after a lot of revolutions, okay? There's a lot of radicalism, there's a lot of wild experiments and then a kind of conservatism sets in and some of the excesses are trimmed away. And I think for the people of New Jersey, for the legislators of New Jersey, women voting along with free blacks was an excess that they didn't want to deal with anymore and then they could trim away. And these were the, the least vocal people in the society so they could do that without threat to their own positions. So, um, you know, I guess I'd say Thinking about this episode of women voting in New Jersey of the female franchise is, is one of the most interesting aspects of, of the book for me. You're stunned into silence. Yes. Uh, I wonder if you could expand a bit on um, the point you're making again about women's involvement in the form movements and the network societies. Were there limits on the kind of So women initially began to get involved in different kinds of activities that were considered an extension of their maternal or familial roles. So they could justify getting involved in organizations to help support widows or orphans because they were helping widows and orphans. It was, it was a religious impulse, it was a moral impulse, it was an extension of what they did at home. It just happened to occur outside of the home. Um, it became a little bit more bleak to justify getting involved in, in uh, temperance movements or the abolition movement. But again, there was this strong religious impulse, this strong moral impulse that helped them initially justify what they were doing. And so, you know, bit by bit, middle class and upper, uh, upper class women began to get more involved in these movements. And it was a way for women to continue associating with other, other women. And through their participation in these organizations, they gained a woman's group consciousness, if you want to call it that, a, a proto-feminist sense of themselves as women. And so this laid the groundwork for an emerging sense that, oh, you know, we as women face certain disabilities. And this became particularly acutely understood in the abolition movement, abolition movement. We're protesting against, uh, against all of the oppression that slaves faced, but in many ways, the condition of women 
and marriage is similar to that of slaves. The legal position of women with regard to their inability to own property is similar to slaves. A uh, husband's ability to tyrannize their wives was similar. So they began to make a comparison between their own status and the status of the people they were advocating for. And so through the participation in those benevolent and reform movements, they came to, and, and again, we're not talking about all women, we're talking about a sort of nucleus of women who made this journey from participation in social reform to feminism. Um, were there kinds of movements that, I think there were kinds of, I think different kinds of women felt drawn toward different kinds of movements. And I think the easiest to justify were those that had an overtly religious or moral purpose. And so more women could be attracted to those. And I think it was more difficult. And of course, with the anti-slavery movement, you start to get criticisms of women for acting outside their proper role, for speaking in public, for getting too involved in politics. And uh, criticisms start to emerge again, that women are violating their proper sphere, that women belong in the home. So uh, I think the anti-slavery movement was a particular flashpoint for criticisms of women violating their proper sphere by being involved in these reform movements. But I think the closer they were to a strictly moral and religious purpose, the more comfortable men and women found uh, their participation in these groups to be. And some of these movements contained both men and women, and, and some of them were women's only groups. Yeah. In, in terms of what you've been able to discover, was there any change in attitude or behavior among loyalist women during the revolution? Uh, about women's rights about or women's, about or Did what? women have to somehow participate in um, a different way well, I, that. yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's kind of the mirror image of what happened to, you know, politicized patriot women. Uh, these loyalist women often felt that they had to defend king and country. They often felt that, you know, and a lot of not a lot of times, but there were times in which, you know, the husband would go off to Britain. Uh, and the wife would stay behind in the colonies to protect the family property and prevent it from confiscation. And at that point then, the woman would have to sort of lie low and not express her political sentiments. And during the revolution itself, political uh, patriot leaders were kind of willing to allow some women to diverge from their husband's political views. And so if there was a loyalist husband who went abroad to Britain, they might allow the woman to say, oh, I support the Patriot cause, I'm not, I don't support him. After the revolution, and this too was kind of part of the backlash, the tolerance for a divergence between men and women's political beliefs begins to be um, lessened. And there are uh, various court decisions that result in, um, in uh, a, a you know, retreat from that notion. So I think during, under the pressures of war, both sides, in both sides, some women get politicized and there is more willingness to acknowledge that women can have independent political positions from their husbands. Um, but after the war, again, I think, on, you know, there's a, a similar retreat from that position among loyalists. Thank you so much.